As you watch this teaching, I would like to ask you to please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it. My name is Rick Renner, and today I am in St. Petersburg, and I'm seated in front of the New Hermitage, a building filled with magnificent treasures, and the treasures begin on the front of the building under this porch. Look at those 10 magnificent statues of Atlas that are carved out of Russian black granite. Each one of them weigh 10 tons. But in this building, it gets even better. For example, there is the Dionysus Room. The Dionysus Room was a room designed to hold Roman sculpture. The sculpture in that room is simply breathtaking. Wow. But then over there in the Winter Palace, there is the Egyptian Room. And when I walk into the Egyptian Room, I just want to linger there because you are surrounded by the relics of ancient Egypt. Coffins, sarcophagi, even a mummy that is seven centuries BC. And when I'm there, I also think about Cairo because when I go to Cairo with my family or friends, there we see the Great Sphinx. When you see the Sphinx, it is truly remarkable. It is just amazing. These are not places that belong in a fairy tale. These are real places, a part of Egyptian history. And of course, one very important part of that history was the birth of Moses. And we read about his birth in the book of Exodus. And when you come to Exodus chapter two, you find that moment when the call of God begins to wake up inside Moses. It was a process. And sometimes when the call of God in your life begins to wake up, it's also a process. You may not immediately understand what's happening, but you'll begin to have new feelings, new emotions. That's the call of God being roused inside you. And that's what happened to Moses. This was the beginning of him becoming the great deliverer. And that is what I want to talk to you about today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Welcome to today's program. My name is Rick Renner. And as I told you in the introduction to today's program, today we're going to talk about the call of God waking up in Moses. Sometimes when the call of God begins to wake up inside you, you don't really understand what's going on. You begin to feel things that you've never felt before. Suddenly you have a desire to do something you've never done before. That's the call of God waking up. And sometimes it's a process and it can take you off guard. And I'm going to show you this today in the life of Moses. But I'm offering you my brand new series called Moses and the Ten Plagues. This is a powerful series. And my friends, it is loaded from beginning to end with insights to the life of Moses and to the plagues which came upon the people of Egypt. It's 10 parts and it comes in multiple formats with a study guide. I work so hard on these study guides. I fill it with information and Greek words and Hebrew words, all the points and principles that are in all these programs. And when you read it, combined with seeing it or hearing it, you really get this Bible teaching down deep inside you. So order yours today by going online or give us a call. And we're also offering you right now my book called How to Keep Your Head on Straight in a World Gone Crazy. The foreword is written by my friend John Bevere. You know, my friend, we're living in a world that seems to have gone berserk. It looks like the world is losing its mind. Well, the Holy Spirit prophesied 2,000 years ago this would happen at the end of the age, and we need to know how to develop discernment for these last times. Just because the world around us is going crazy does not mean we have to lose our head. There's a way for us to keep our head on straight in a world gone crazy. This book will help you. It will really help you. That's why I wrote it. So I want you to order your copy today. And we're also offering you right now my book called Last Day's Survival Guide. The foreword is by Perry Stone. The subtitle says, A Scriptural Handbook to Prepare You for These Perilous Times. We're living in perilous times. And as time moves forward, it's going to become more perilous. It's just the end time season. 
that we live in. But God wants us to thrive in this season. We've seen this week in this teaching that the people of Israel, even when they were in Egypt and were being oppressed, they multiplied. They waxed mighty. God blessed them. It doesn't matter what season we're living in. God wants his blessing to be on us. And likewise, we can thrive in the end of the age. We just need to know how. And that's why I want you to order my book, Last Day's Survival Guide, a scriptural handbook to prepare you for these perilous times. You can order it by going online or give us a call right now. And when you call or go online, if you have a prayer request, let us know how to pray for you. We really want to pray for you. But reach for your Bible. I've got my Bible. We always use the Bible in this program. And today we're going to return to Exodus chapter 2, verse 1, which says, And there went a man from the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. We know from Exodus chapter 6, verse 20, the man's name was Amram and the woman's name was Jochebed. These were the parents of Moses. Verse 2 says, And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, we covered that in the last program. If you missed that, go back to the archives and see it. But she hid him for three months. Verse 3. And when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein and laid it in the flags by the river's brink. That word ark is the same word used to describe Noah's ark, which of course was an ark of deliverance. It carried Noah's family through a terrible time into safety. And likewise, when she fashioned this little boat, she made it like an ark. I think she probably was thinking of Noah's ark. And now this was an ark that was going to carry her son into safety, and it would be an ark of deliverance for the people of Israel. But the Bible tells us in verse 4, And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. Verse 5, And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. Verse 6, And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him, and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. God supernaturally guided the currents of the Nile to carry that little ark of deliverance right into the hands of Pharaoh's daughter. Verse 7, Then said his sister, who was Miriam, to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for thee? And here we find God had a plan that Moses' own mother would raise him in the formative years of his life. God enabled Jochebed to raise her own child in his very earliest years and to instill the word of God into him. And that's why Proverbs 22, 6 comes to mind for me. It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. It looked like Moses departed from what she put into him. But the Bible promises, if you train up a child in the way he should go when he's old, he will not depart from it. What you put in a child or in a grandchild comes back to them eventually. And that's what happened with Moses. But in Exodus 2, verse 8, Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. And the maid went and called the child's mother, verse 9. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee wages. In other words, God made sure that Jochebed was paid for raising her own son. And the Bible says the woman took the child and nursed it, verse 10, and the child grew. Now listen to this. The child grew and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter at the appointed time and he became her son. He became Pharaoh's daughter's son. And she, that is Pharaoh's daughter, called his name Moses. So Moses was not the name given to him by his mother Jochebed. Moses was the name given to him by Pharaoh's daughter. Therefore, the word Moses is purely an Egyptian name. The name Thut Moses was the name of the current Pharaoh who was sitting on the throne. Really, it was the family name. There was Thut Moses the first, the second, Thut Moses the third. So this was a common name in this particular family and in their dynasty. But the name Thut Moses, which was the name of this family, really means born of Thoth. You say, well, who is Thoth? Thoth was an Egyptian god. It was the god of writing, 
the God of magic, the God of wisdom, the God of sophistication, the God of development. And it was believed that this God, Thoth, was a self-created God. And Moses was named in this family Thoth Moses. This was the family that he grew up in, and he was very connected to this God that was a self-created God, a self-existing God. So you can imagine this had significance to Moses when he finally met the real God on Mount Horeb and God declared himself as I am that I am. He is the self-existing real God. This was quite a revelation just for Moses. But we're told in Acts chapter 7, verse 21. And when he, that's Moses, when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. The word nourish, the Greek word means to rear, to nourish, to educate. She educated him and nourished him for her own son. The word for in Greek is the word ice, which means into it indicates transition or movement. She was positioning Moses to be her own son and eventually to be the heir of the throne in Egypt. And in Acts 7.22, the Bible describes his education. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. And when the Bible says he was learned, it is a form of the Greek word paideo, which means to be instructed, to be educated, to be trained. He reached his full potential as an Egyptian man. And the Bible says in all the wisdom, the word all is all encompassing. It really means in all the wisdom, the word wisdom here, the Greek word Sophia, which describes insight, skill, intelligence, philosophy, sophistication, one that is especially bright, educated, astute, smart, one that is eminently enlightened. That is a depiction of Moses as an Egyptian individual. He was raised in science, in learning, in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. He was trained in geography, history, grammar, writing, literature, philosophy, music, even in Egyptian religion. And the Bible says he was mighty. The word mighty is the Greek word dunitas. This word dunitas, translated mighty, describes a powerful force. It means Moses was a powerful force. It depicts amazing ability, one that is able, capable, or competent for any task. That's who Moses was as an adult Egyptian man. And the Bible goes on to say he was mighty in words and in deeds. The word words is a form of the Greek word logos. It describes verbal communication, which means before he went into the wilderness, he was a masterful speaker. He was a masterful communicator. And the Bible says he was also mighty in Deeds, the word deeds, the Greek word ergon, it depicts all of his actions in every way. Moses was known to be bright, eminently bright. He was learned. He had reached adulthood as an Egyptian man. He was educated in so many different things and he was mighty. He was mighty. He was competent. He was a great masterful orator, a speaker, and he was known to be mighty in all of his deeds and all of his actions. And if you go back to Exodus chapter 2, verse 10, it tells us something else very, very important. Listen to this. And the child grew, and she, Jochebed, that's the mother of Moses, brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter. Remember, she had raised him from an infant. And he became Pharaoh's daughter's son. Now listen. And she, Pharaoh's daughter, called his name Moses. And then it adds, and she said, because I drew him out of water, the word Moses means drawn out of water. Hmm. What water did she draw him out of? She drew him out of the Nile. This is very important because the Nile was believed to be the life giver to Egypt and the birthplace of all gods. When she saw that baby in that ark, to her eyes, it looked like the Nile was producing the next god for Egypt. The Nile was revered as the father of life and the mother of all men. It was considered to be a manifestation of the God happy who blessed the land with life. It was connected with the goddess Mayat who embodied the concepts of truth, harmony, and balance. It was also linked to the God Kanum, 
who was the God of rebirth and creation and was originally the God of the Nile who, can flow, who controlled the flood and the flows of the Nile, which produced prosperity and growth in the land. So when this daughter named him Moses, this had very great significance. It was the equivalent of saying Moses was a gift of the God to the people. Moses was to be a source of life to the Egyptians. Moses was to be a life giver to Egypt. Moses was to bring harmony and balance to Egypt. Moses was a rebirth of deity for Egypt. And Moses was elevated to the rank of a god. Wow, that's why she named him Moses. And Josephus tells us, now Moses understanding became superior for his age, nay, far beyond that standard. And when he was taught, he discovered greater quickness of apprehension than was usual at his age. And his actions at that time promised greater when he should come of age of a man. God did also give him that tallness. And as for his beauty, there was nobody so unpolite as when they saw Moses that they were not greatly surprised at the beauty of his countenance. So he was handsome. He was intellectually bright. He was impressive. And Josephus goes on to say, Moses, therefore, when he was born, was brought up in the foregoing manner and came to age of maturity and made his virtue manifest to the Egyptians. That is what Josephus wrote about him. But wait, Acts 7, specifically says he was mighty. There's another way he was mighty. Moses was militarily mighty. He led the Egyptians against the Ethiopians and Josephus wrote about that. Josephus said the Ethiopians, who are the next neighbors to the Egyptians, made an inroad into their country, which they seized upon and carried off the effects of the Egyptians. So Moses, at the persuasion both of Thermuzus, that was Pharaoh's daughter, and the king himself cheerfully undertook the business. Those of the Egyptians at once overcame their enemies by Moses' valor. Moses prevented the enemies. He came upon the Ethiopians before they expected him and joining the battle with them, he beat them and deprived them of the hopes they had of success against the Egyptians and went on in overthrowing their cities and indeed made a great slaughter of the Ethiopians. That is who he was before the call of God woke up inside him. But wait, wait, wait. In Exodus chapter 2 and verse 11, we read, And it came to pass in those days when he was so mighty, he was so positioned in a powerful place in Egypt, he eventually would inherit the throne of Egypt. In those days, when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens, and he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew one of his brethren. Here we have Proverbs 22, verse 6, becoming a reality. It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. What his mother put in him when he was very young began to wake up. Now the call of God in him is beginning to be aroused. And the Bible says, and it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, he was already an adult. In fact, the Bible tells us he was 40 years old. Exodus 2, 11 that he went into his brethren and looked on their burdens and spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. In Acts 7, verse 23, it says it like this. And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. Came, the Greek word anabino, means it welled up inside him. Suddenly, something in him began to wake up. He suddenly had a desire to leave the palace he had lived a life separated from the people of Israel, but now something in him was waking up, welling up inside him. I've got to go. I've got to inspect their condition. He was 40 years old. He had not been with them in years and years and years. And suddenly something in him said, you've got to go. You've got to see. And the Bible tells us in verse 11, he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens and he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren, verse 12. And he looked this way and that way. And when he saw there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. A deliverer 
was beginning to wake up inside Moses. And the reason that Moses hit him in the sand is because Moses was embarrassed by his deed. He couldn't even figure out why he did this. Why would he even behave in such a way? Why would he deliver these men that he didn't even know? Because the deliverer was beginning to wake up inside him. That is precisely the reason why. And the Bible tells us in verse 15, Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses, but Moses fled from the face of a Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. But wait, that's not all. Listen to what the Bible says next because when he got into the land of Midian, he did something else totally unexpected. The Bible tells us. Now the priest of Midian, this is Exodus chapter 2, verse 16, had seven daughters and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their flocks. Verse 17, and the shepherds, that's other shepherds came and drove the girls away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. Why did he do that? He didn't even know these girls. But when he saw an injustice, something in him was roused. Just like he was roused when he saw the Egyptians smiting a Hebrew. And he had to do something about it. Now he sees these shepherds that he doesn't know giving a hard time to the girls that he doesn't know, but something in him cannot tolerate this. The deliverer is beginning to stand up inside him and he delivers them. And the Bible tells us in Exodus 2, 18, and when they came to Ruel, their father, he said, how is it that you're come so soon today? And listen to what the girl said in verse 19. And they said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds. The call of God on Moses' life was beginning to wake up. What in the world was he doing? He was positioned to be the next Pharaoh of Egypt. He was mighty in words and deeds. Everyone knew him. They treated him like he was a God that was given to Egypt by the Nile. But now something in him has been roused. He's behaving in ways that he does not understand doing things that he never anticipated he would do. The deliverer is beginning to wake up inside him because Exodus 2, 24 says, God heard the groanings of Israel and remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Verse 25, and God looked upon the children of Israel and God had respect unto them. It was time for the deliverer to come forth. Wow. And now the call of God in Moses is beginning to wake up. It's being aroused inside him. And my friend, I'm telling you, sometimes when the call of God wakes up in you, you begin to do things you didn't anticipate. You begin to feel things you've never felt. That is the call of God waking up inside you. And now Moses was about to find out he has been called he has been anointed to be the great deliverer for the people of Israel. I'm out of time, but I'll be back in just a moment, and I want to pray for you. The story of Moses and the Ten Plagues is one of the most exciting stories in the Bible. But in this new 10-part series by Rick Renner, you'll hear this story like you've never heard it before. In this series, Rick Renner takes us into the world of ancient Egypt, pyramids, tombs, and treasure cities, and explains that God's people there were blessed until a specific moment in time, and then hardships began. But God had a plan to deliver them that was already set into motion. In this riveting series, you'll learn that no weapon formed against you will prosper, how God's plans for your life will not be thwarted by any attack, how God always pays the enemy back for all the evil he has done to you, the significance of all 10 plagues that fell on the land of Egypt, in this fast-moving series, you'll learn that God has a plan for your deliverance, too. This 10-part series is available in digital or physical format starting at just $20. In addition, we're offering you the books How to Keep Your Head On Straight in a World Gone Crazy for $20 and Last Day's Survival Guide for $25. There is so much information in the New Testament about end-time events, and Scripture tells us how to live victoriously in Christ in these times. These are two books you need to know how to thrive in these turbulent times. Don't miss this special offer, this series, Moses and the Ten Plagues, and the books, How to Keep Your Head On Straight in a World Gone Crazy, and Last Day's Survival Guide. 
Call the number on your screen now or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. My friend, this is Rick Renner, and I need just a moment to talk to you about a need in our ministry, and I'm asking you to help meet the need. We need a new building in the United States because we are bursting at the seams. People are reaching out to us for resources, for prayer, for spiritual support, and what a blessing that they would reach out to us. That is a real God-given trust, and we take it very seriously, but we need more space because we have no more room for more employees so that we can take those calls and minister to people's needs. And if you saw our storage units, you would be shocked. We are totally out of space. We're even putting materials in containers on the backside of our property. And at the same time, in Moscow, we're building a brand new TV studio because we want to produce the best Bible teaching programs we can for God's people all over the planet. What an opportunity. It is a gospel opportunity. We're told in Isaiah chapter 54, expand your cords, lengthen your stakes, get ready for growth. My friends, it's already here. We are growing. And I know that you would like to be a part of making a difference in the lives of all those people that are reaching out to us. And so I'm saying to you today, can you help us? Would you please become a part of the giving team that sows into this project for a new building in America, a new studio in Moscow, and together we will reach our arms around the world with the teaching of the Bible that will change people's lives. And if it's in your heart to say, yes, Brother Rick, I want to be a part of this, then just go online right now. You can read how to participate or give us a call. We're ready to receive your call. And by the way, when you call, always remember to let us know how to pray for you because this ministry is about you and it's about the people that we're called to reach. Tomorrow, we're going to see how Moses met God on Mount Horeb. It's going to be powerful. Please do not miss tomorrow's program, but order the whole series. It's 10 parts, Moses and the 10 plagues. It comes with a study guide. My friend, this is such powerful teaching. Today, we've seen that the call of God is aroused inside us. The call of God is probably being aroused inside you. You just need to know how to recognize it. We're also offering you my book, called How to Keep Your Head on Straight in a World Gone Crazy. And we're also offering you my book, which is called Last Day's Survival Guide. Please order these today. You can order it by going online or give us a call. And please let us know how to pray for you. And I speak the call of God to you and spiritual sensitivity to recognize when the call of God in you begins to well up, when it begins to be aroused inside you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll see you tomorrow, but remember Ecclesiastes 8, 4, where the word of a king is, there is power. Rick Renner Ministries is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ through every available media to the uttermost parts of the earth. Discover the many ways you can help us make a difference in lives around the world with the word of God. We invite you to partner with us in teaching, strengthening, and rescuing lives for the glory of God. Together, we can make a difference that will last throughout eternity. As you watch this teaching, I would like to ask you to please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it. 